Hey, how you doing there? I'm Thomas Nyback. This is 365 Days Towards Racial Change. And uh, I like auto racing, but now they're having a rain delay and messing up the race. <laughs> uh, it was actually supposed to happen yesterday, and, uh, but it got rained out and stuff. But I love, I like driving too. I like driving fast. <laughs> so seeing guys, men and women, go to two, 200 some odd miles an hour around the track, or even the Indy cars even faster, turns me on. <laughs> I like that. Anyway, rain delay. Let's get let's get some work out of the way. Can't be all play, damn it. We're here talking about black issues in America. You know, speaking of auto racing, though. Know, why aren't there more black folks represented in that uh, in that space? And, you know, and um, you find a definite relation between uh, economics and the sports in which black folks participate. If you can get a hold of a ball. Uh, a relatively decent lot, a hoop, or a field, and a ball, you know, or you kick a ball, whatever, anything, most things with a ball, then you got a good shot at uh, perfecting your skill and participating in the ball sports, soccer, um, basketball, football. Uh, basketball, football being the big three for us, but now those sports that's going to cost money to participate and maintain, especially at a at a young age. Well, you're going to have to be uh, well gifted, funded uh, specifically. You know, Biles with her uh, achievements. You know that 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 cost some. Uh, there needs to be some economic movement going on there for her to stay on the bar and on the performing and stuff like that on the horse and stuff like that. That, that takes uh, a lot of economic energy, a lot of sacrifice, you know, uh, hockey, you know, if you, you see a black ho hockey player in the NHL, well, there, there it's, it's, uh, it's not, I guess, normally the guy who started uh, playing hockey in college, <laughs> you know. Uh, these are, you know, white men. <laughs> you notice that they're from Europe. <laughs> uh, if they're from the United States, that they've either, either from a northern state or in a place where they can pay to uh, be in the ice rink and... Uh, participate in that kind of sport. It's going to cost some money, some movement. <clears throat> oh, don't let me forget baseball. I knew I was forgetting something. Now, uh, auto racing, forget about it. <laughs> uh, you're talking uh, probably some major financial movement there. And, uh, you know, uh, keeping a machine healthy is quite a feat, you know. Uh, the, these bodies, yeah, you know, we're, we're, you know, our medicine is perfected, but uh, if you look at one race, I, I, maybe I, I, I'm kind of now curious about what's the dollar figure for that car to finish the race, you know, you got five or six guys in the pit crew, you got a spotter. You got a, a, a kind of an overhead manager, coach guy in there. You got the driver to support. Multiple tires, expensive fuel, top-notch parts, body. Uh, you know, you're talking. You know, uh, a lot of investment there. And you know, hmm, black people are mysteriously absent. From that sport, you know, and, and I'm not. I'm t hopefully I'm preaching to the choir. It shouldn't be any big surprise. And no, I don't want to go marching on Daytona, Talladega, 
Bristol, <laughs> Indy. No, I don't want to do all, any of that. Uh, to get a black driver and a black team, you know. But you know, it's about competition, competing, and stuff like that. You know, uh, blacks are absent. You know, it'd be nice to see one day. You know, if, if we could get there before maybe some other groups. You know, right now it's dominated by white men. You know, had Annika go through there a little bit and stuff. You'll see women appearing but white men yeah that's their that's theirs you know but i like watching it just because i drive i like to drive a lot oh so black issues look you know on that note like but what happened in america why can't everybody all colors races peoples sexes uh be paid incredibly and participate and stuff like that you know uh, why isn't there this level playing field america says it is it's our, our documentation on the surface says it is but uh yet you've got this disparity you know uh, and uh sports sports is tells us a lot about america's America's process. You see a lot in sports. It's almost flipped around in uh, in entertainment, except for genres. You know, white people kind of have rock and uh, uh, you know metals and, and some of that other stuff. Secure, where black folks got their stuff and, and uh, more black folks are more mainstream uh within entertainment uh so that that's you know that that's the opposite but i think that's a difference in creativity and financing as well as an issue uh you know so on that note the black mind of america what do we you know when i'm watching a race watching white men go around in a circle Oval, I'm sorry, uh, 200 miles an hour and stuff. Uh, but am I present? Do I understand the, the racial statement that's being declared? You know, even their fan base, they're, the people there, it's a white audience physically there. You know, is, am, am I critiquing, am, you know, am I rightly understand it yeah i'm entertained i like that part but uh the cost of the entertainment uh, who's being included excluded things like that the mind of america so i'm concerned about the black mind how does it navigate does it what what happens to my mind to other black minds when we're looking at some entertainment some sports and we see this, you know, we see certain sectors of the sport or the sport itself dominated by white folks, right? You, uh, you know, the NFL, right? You never saw a black quarterback, you kidding me, right? You know, but uh, black quarterbacks finally got their breakthrough, got some rings and stuff like that. And you'll find, you know, on and on, you know, but and conversely, the white mind. See, the white mind, it does. I doubt white folks are looking at uh, their white entertainment, white sports, white dominated sports, scratching their head or feeling some kind of way that there's no representation of uh, black folks in there, you know. Uh, the white mind is more matter of fact. It's uh, an expectation. Is uh, you know, it's no surprise that racing is a white sport dominated by white folks. You know, and the the entitlement, the privilege that goes with that. You know, keeping that machine going. You know, you see, you know, the state of the arts uh, safety within the vehicle you know these guys 
can roll multiple times down the track, that the car can disintegrate and they'll walk away, give an interview, you know, things like that, you know. And next week, they're going to have a shiny new car ready to go, you know. But that's par for the course. Well, you know, what else are you going to do with it? Of course, we're going to survive crashes, have a brand new car lined up next week in top shape, ready to run in NASCAR. You know, black people need to get to that point when, when this project is kind of about that. Next point, this good dovetail today working out on the point of finances and sports is for financial literacy. You know, uh, well, how do we get to a point where we get more black representation in hockey, if that's the thing? You know, it's a culture and things like that, you know, breakthroughs. But, you know, if we wanted to compete and participate, you know, how do we get there? You know, I, I got to start sending my kid to the ice rink at six and seven years old uh, for drills and, and uh, to become prolific. You know, I've got to have incredible amount of resources uh, generated to sustain this vehicle and the, a host of other people, managers, pit crews, drivers, teams, you know, uh, you know, when you watch a car race, uh, sponsorship is huge, right? Uh, they, I just saw a piece, they were just doing a piece with uh, the king, Richard Petty. And, uh, you know, when he raced back in his day, a NASCAR was uh, just getting its thing together. Everybody's got a starting point. And at that point, it wasn't, you know, STP was probably the biggest sponsor and maybe some other oil gas companies uh, were big sponsors. Mostly you had the brand of the car, the make and stuff were, was promoted. But now you got everything. We've got sandwiches. Um, we got logistics carriers. <laughs> you know, these cars are, are have uh, you know, their logo. It's painted on there. And then when when they bring the cameras inside, uh, they show more little commercials of sponsors in there. Well, that's that financial literacy will help us understand these these sponsors are the cash flow to support this uh, mechanism uh, out there on the racetrack. Uh, and it's important you need that, you know. Who's got private money? I mean, private money does exist to do that. Uh, but it's more, it works better for the sponsors, for the sandwiches and the logistics carriers uh, and, and websites to sponsor and uh, keep their that car out there. So it's a, you know, it's a three hour commercial of these cars going around the track. Financial literacy helps understand that, and, and I, that's an important point because for the energy, the power that Black folks are need to have, we need to, we're going to need to create uh, some uh, some entities. Let me just put it that way: entities that are going to support, throw resources and money at the primary project, you know. For racing, the primary goal is to get the cars around the track, you know, uh, and their sponsors pour money in to that uh, enterprise. Blacks need to have this financial literacy as part. I've talked a lot, of, a lot of different aspects about financial literacy. You know, today is sponsorship. How, how do we, you know, get that financial support. Yeah, we want businesses, we want financial control and all that, uh, but is there something we can uh, support uh, collectively with our funds? I think that's, that's an important question, important aspect 
to think about. Financial literacy. Time's getting away from me here. Listen, I'm inspired by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. I've read three of his works. Uh, he's got plenty of material. He's got he's all over YouTube. Easy to find. Dr. Claude Anderson. Get these books if you can. Uh, at the end of the year, hope maybe I'll be in a position to have a little contest or something. I don't know. A Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask. Black Labor, White Wealth, Search for Power and Economic Justice. And we are finishing up. Uh, just got a couple more days in our series uh, on the analysis portion of leadership. Hopefully you followed along. Uh, oh, and on that note, the next two days, I'm going to just bring my brainstorming points. You know, there, there are some areas that I, I feel Dr. Anderson could have magnified or mentioned, you know, his work is complete, but nothing's really exhausted in any field. Uh, and Poweronomics, Dr. Anderson's national plan to empower black America. You can find Dr. Anderson at Poweronomics.com. Behind me, you'll see the hashtag us two symbol. You'll see uh, black women there conversing together. I think that's fa at Facebook. Check out Black Enough, B-L-A-G-G-E-N-U-F. Have a black Facebook experience. This is the wide, World Wide Web. If you can't find your flavor, your voice, out of the billions of sites and millions and stuff, emails, then um, start your own, like I did. Uh, just get it, get it out there. Get it off your chest. This is healing. This is catharsis, you know, this is the reaming out of, of some clogged areas of my life that's been bound up and been mysterious in my life. And uh, I'm getting over myself through this uh, little experiment, year-long experiment. And finally, Uncle Tom's Cabin, don't miss reading this book. Please read this book. I can't say enough. I, you know, we got plenty. We got Roots. We got the movie Rosewood. Uh, all kinds of things, media and whatnot. If you read that book, you'll find why it is no longer so uh, relevant. No, it's it's relevant. No, that's not the word I want. Why it's not promoted or talked about in today's world. You know. You know, it's interesting about truth and what matters. The forces that be would control it like state-run television or something like that, which in a lot of ways television is state-run. Another subject. Uh, but they can't get it all in America. Uh, good information slips through. And uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin is very informative. Please get it and read it. Now, with our last moments here, this is uh, Dr. Anderson's seventh point. It's his last analysis point. I'm going to bring two more in the coming days. Uh, but uh, this point is to be, it's, oh, I entitled it like the realities of power. It's about, um, you know, to give you just a hint, it's, it's about being wise as power develops, uh, looking out for leaders who can be uh, sidetracked either through bribes, uh, outright assassination, you know, or, you know, just dissuaded from their message. We, we don't want that. We, we're pretty clear here, at least, and Dr. Anderson that black success is going to need to be exclusive, uh, assertive, you know, visible, competitive, all these things in America. And um, other people are doing a lot of other things. It's America. There's a plethora of expressions across the land. Uh, but I always want to make it clear that my purpose and focus is to see black people compete, 
uh, to be looked at as uh, competitive equals in the American system. And to do that, we need uh, we need some economic help. We need kind of the white establishment and power to kind of get out the way. We're, we're working on that. We're massaging that and all that. But uh, it's, it's a long journey to go. It's uh, going to help if we're realistic, though, as as and if we grow in popularity, it, it, this is America. You as you, the cream rises to the top, well, that becomes the target. You know, uh, I, I like coffee and put a little cream, or ice cream, or cream on it. You know, I, I'm I'm very much tempted to take that off the top first. It's risen to the top. You know, same way in the world. It's why. Our president on the 4th of July, pres uh, this, uh, birthday of America, he's got to stand behind bulletproof glass uh, for safety. Any leader, uh, we're going to look at some things here in these last few minutes. Uh, you know, it's the realities of leadership, growth, black power, and how it can become a target for violence, infiltration, uh, uh, attacks. I've been attacked uh, here and there, here in this forum, but it's okay. Atlanta, 1906, Greenwood Community, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921, Rosewood, 1923, Malcolm, 1965, King, 1968, Fred Hampton, 1969, in Chicago. And assassinated in his bed and then eyewitnesses tell us that he, he crawled out of his bed he was alive until the police took put two in the back of his head and you know, they made sure that black man was not going to survive Black Panther uh, but any uh, research commentary I've seen shows him doing good in the community empowering black people, such and such. So, you know, get the flavor. Those uh, cities and areas of America I mentioned are cities sacked um, <sighs> under very violent circumstances, white mobs gather, you know, most of these incidents of these towns. And uh, there's a big list. I just gave you a sampling big list of thriving black communities sacked and, it, and it usually the story is that some black man has looked at or talked to a white woman in, the, in an appropriate way and the mob, the white mob goes and takes out a, a whole flourishing, thriving, lucrative, economically sound black communities. Um, you know, uh, this is an int this is a very good point. I think Dr. Anderson's like, let's be realistic. We're not just uh, what we're reaching for. What we're working towards is going to be threatening uh, to the white establishment, to white power. You know, the the, you know, the white power is going to do all it can to uh, to keep the the lid on the pot, so to speak. You know. I told you a story of my mother cooking a, uh, a, a lobster, right? She fought with that thing for a long time before it died in the boiling pot, right? It was trying to get out. And she, and she had, I remember her physically on the pot, on the stove, kind of keeping that animal in, in the pot to boil to death, right? Uh, I think she may have been traumatized from the experience. I might talk to her about that someday. Uh, you know, so he's being, he's saying, look, be realistic. Don't just think you're going to get in the power and position and still be uh, and your experience is still going to be so safe like you're poor, broke, and impotent. You know, no, once, 
once power comes along, once lives begin to change, and once the, the message starts to be adhered to, then you're a, you're making a threat uh, to other powers that be. And uh, you know, I think you know, and this is embedded in this nation, that this hyper violent reaction to blackness. So it's it's very obvious and apparent in law enforcement. And I and I, I question our government like there's there's no initiative to put blacks in a protective status with this this blatant uh, attitude. Uh, towards just uh, taking black life so quickly, the, these white law enforcement. Now, I got a criticism for Pete Buttigieg. He says, you know, he uh, he, he seemed to indicate that uh, law enforcement could be improved better by more black involvement. Like, you know, he, he's out, he does, he's not hearing himself. Remember, Power doesn't hear itself. It just it has a huge blank blind spot when it starts to talk about solutions, right? So his solution is indicative of a white attitude toward black men, white law enforcement towards black men to just be so quick to pull the trigger and take individuals out of the picture, you know, but. And he, he's saying in light of that, well, we need black people to police black people. I got I could say a lot about a whole lot of that, but, you know, he, he doesn't blame a white biased polarized system that feels so threatened by black people uh, running away or black people who are wounded. I mean, we, we've got black men who've been shot multiple times. You know, you know, you know, shoot him in the leg, and, you know, and just disable them. These guys are chopping up uh, the black flesh for some reason. So, you know, um, so Pete, you know, I got to shut, you know, call him out on that. You know, it's not black people's fault that they're not participating in, in the regime or the institution that's killing them. That's not their fault, Pete. Come on. Uh, we got to look out uh, our leadership in this analysis about the you know, power and realities. You know, we, we got to keep our leaders on point. <laughs> you know, Dr. King, a lot of folks had great intentions and all that, but then suddenly they they introduce all this inclusionary speech um, and that they, they they put blacks alongside immigrants and, and uh, people of color and all this boy did that open the door and totally dilute uh, the effectiveness for black people uh, in America you know as a group we, we know we can't we don't even can't even find ourselves anymore as we approach power you know you'll find us sequestered in areas uh, of America where we're given just enough to survive there but we can't break out we can't climb up and all this I saw a little piece I think his name rapper from way back uh, Ja Rule maybe no not Ja Rule Rock in, and uh, the I've kind of been living in it, my little piece of luxury in America for a little little while now. But they showed uh, clips of his neighborhoods, you know, Biggie Smalls, New York type, you know, ghetto areas and stuff like that. And I've almost forgotten, you know, what what the concrete jungle looks like and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, these are, they're just housing and where black folks are sequestered and frozen there, you know, tough to get out, tough to navigate, you know, this kind of thing. So, so our leaders, though, need to be 
uh, men and women who will not all pray um, uh, to being enticed with the brass ring or enticed to dilute their message or to soften their stance and things like that. They're, they're going to have to really dig down deep. And I'll tell you, and I think this is true for all the other groups, the Hmong, Vietnamese, you know, you look at these groups, Arabs, that stick to their guns and their loyalty, they self-sacrifice, you know. Yeah, the white majority can fulfill my dreams, but I'm loyal to my group, and I want my group to rise up and succeed. Your, your money, you know, six, seven figures just doesn't interest me. It's because if I leave off of this message, of this trajectory, hundreds, thousands are going to suffer. You know, where is that loyalty in the black community? Uh, blacks are always used for always the fodder, the consumer, and all that. But you know, we don't see any black agenda happening in the media or America. I'm out of time. I hope I was articulate. <laughs> In this space, but a, definitely a good conversation. Next two days, I got some other, some of my own personal thoughts to forward. I'm going to see if the race came back on yet. See what's going on. Listen, I'm Tom Lins Nyback. It's day 188 out of the way. 365 days towards racial change. I will see you tomorrow. Bye bye.